Welcome viewers to our program on the Government in Action. I am your host, Shania Prasad, and joining me is Minister of Human Services and Social Security, the Honorable Dr. Vinder Prasad. Minister, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me on today's program. Great. So to jump right into it, the first question I want to ask you is on the Difficult Circumstances Unit. We saw that over just under 3,000 persons benefited from it in the past two years. What developments are happening in this program? This program is a program that offers a plethora of services and we work directly with the most vulnerable across the country. And in the last two years, we would have introduced a number of initiatives and we are building out on those. For example, we started the Pampers Bank and from that Pampers Bank, we are now able to provide three months of Pampers for persons who are living with disabilities or for children or for senior citizens. That's going very well. All it requires is the information for us to assist and a simple means test. In addition to that, the biggest program coming out of the Difficult Circumstances Unit in recent times, the one that I believe has been most impactful, is the one that offers support or assistive aids to persons living with disabilities. We have managed to really help persons with disabilities with anything from a wheelchair to a walker to a white cane to a cane, and this only requires a request. In addition to persons coming in to request that, we have gone through our many outreaches across the country and delivered those to persons right at their homes or within their communities. And I think this is significant because no such program existed before. And coming into the ministry, I was struck in 2020 how difficult it was for persons who lived with disabilities, especially those with mobility issues, how difficult it was for them to access these assistive aids. And as a follow-up to that, we worked on training programs that would have helped persons who live with disabilities to access training to improve their quality of life and even in the case of mobility, give them information and guidance on how to utilize their assistive aids so that they can improve in their participation in daily activities and how they can access other opportunities that government of Guyana is offering or even how they can gain employment. We have managed to train just about under 500 persons living with disabilities and we would have done those trainings in ICT, including the JAWS program. We're still continuing to do that. And we have been working to get people to utilize a revolving fund. And that is a fund specifically for persons living with disabilities to start micro enterprise. So all of that emanated from this one program focused on providing assistive support aids for persons living with disability at no cost. We also would have been working hand in hand with the Ministry of Health through a referral pathway on hearing aids. As you know, this is offered free of cost through the Ministry of Health. So we have been referring persons so that they could access a hearing aid. Sometimes people do not know where to go and they come to the difficult circumstances unit for help. The usual thing that happens there also is the provision of hampers. Here again, people can walk off and request hampers or we would go into communities and do that. We work on assisting people with funerals. We also work with I would say persons who would have experienced damage to property, notably fire. We would have done extensive work supporting people who are trying to rebuild, especially if they live with a disability, they're a pensioner, and they need something done to their home. We work along with them. In the cases where we can't, we would refer them to Food for the Poor or another program, but we are in direct contact with them. And in any case where there is a crisis, we would have been reaching out through the difficult circumstances unit. Another program that I see as very impactful is one that started last year to gain momentum and it commenced in late 2021. This is the I Care program. Mm -hmm. To date, we would have managed to distribute just around 3,000 pairs of spectacles and these spectacles would have gone to the furthest areas across the country because not only can people come into the ministry and get this assistance we did have a christmas special last year but we go into the communities we take the entire team to test those persons focuses on the elderly people living with disabilities children and also those persons who are in key areas and we want them to be able to have all access to 
spectacles so that they can maybe teach better or do better wherever they are. And so the eye care program is one that is creating tremendous impact in communities. And that's just a little of what we do through the Difficult Circumstances Unit. Awesome work, Minister. And speaking of some more recent programs launched by your ministry is the Young Influencers Program, right? And we've seen a lot of young people gain tremendous opportunities from that program. What can you tell us are the major benefits of that program and how can people, young people get involved in that? This is a program that's close to my heart because this is a program that I crafted very early when I became minister and we have now seen two batches of young influencers graduate from this program. They have been exposed to anything from speaking at the UN, going to conferences hosted by the EU, and having a presence on international platforms where they present Guyana's program as it relates to young people specific to this ministry and in some instances on a broader base like when you talk about human rights we just have three young influencers who were off to Europe and they had that opportunity to participate in a conference. And of course, there are always local opportunities. A number of our young influencers would have participated in the debates, the speaker's debate, the youth parliament. And in addition to those public speaking opportunities, advocacy opportunities, they would have been working with the ministry to help to give some input in a very major way to campaigns that I think impact very heavily on young people, such as the anti-bullying campaign, the anti-body shaming campaign. The young people did the first draft of those campaigns, those strategies, and we also encourage them to work in various areas within the ministry. Part of their training revolves around being aware of and gaining information on the various departments, getting training on those, and being integral to some of the sessions working with young people, for example, the Family Enhancement Unit, mm -hmm. where we work with Youth at Risk, Child Care and Protection Agency, where they will do programs with children in homes, school programs where they may go out and share the information that they would have gained through the ministry. And there is also that leadership building program component within it. And we also encourage our young people to network among themselves because the Young Influencers Program will have the participation of young people from every region. Right. And they also go out into their communities, network there, share solutions to problems, develop programs, and work on initiatives that have an impact, whether in their sphere of work or study or the wider community. So it's, it's a program that is developing a young person to be in this mode where they're solutions oriented, where they can identify challenges, look at ways in which as a young person, they bring that perspective to the table and where they're trained and they're nurtured in such a way where they have a vision for young people in the future. They're not afraid to share their views. They're not afraid to be advocates, nor are they afraid to come up with recommendations for this ministry so that we can have, as I always want to have, that youth perspective in our programs. Nice. And moving on to a pressing issue, which is um, human trafficking. Guyana maintained its mm -hmm. tier one ranking, right? Um, in 2017, we were on the watch list for tier two. And since then, we've managed to keep that tier one ranking. What does that mean for Guyana? I think it means that government is committed to countering trafficking in persons. And this is a multidisciplinary approach. At the helm of this would be two ministries, Ministry of Home Affairs and Ministry of Human Services. In fact, with the recently passed legislation in Parliament, one that I took to the floors and got unanimous support, we are now co-chairing a special committee set up to, ta to target trafficking in persons. That committee brings together a number of agencies, a number of persons who are now tasked to develop a national action plan that will feed into some of the things that are requested when we have to have a report that determines our tier one ranking. We are looking at a number of things that would have come out in the last year, number of convictions. We would have struggled in maybe two years ago to have that. We're seeing more convictions happening. This is good in terms of maintaining our tier one ranking. We're looking at restitution happening, which never really happened before. It is in the new act, but it was something that was not a given 
we got at least two persons receiving restitution. We are also looking at the support services provided to persons who have experienced trafficking and who are survivors of trafficking. And this Ministry of Human Services would work very closely with the Ghana Police Force and the Ministry of Home Affairs. And we would provide long-term support, immediate and long-term support. We also have shelters that we provide. And that's another thing that the tier one ranking depends on. Training is a huge thing. And over the last two years, we would have trained thousands of people in various areas, from the Ghana Defense Force to the police force, to people who are in customs, people who are at our borders, people who work in transportation. So there are many, many layers of persons who are very much poised to pick up when trafficking happens. So we would have done enormous amounts of training and that's also good because awareness information we did have a march last year mm -hmm. this is trafficking in persons month and we will be having a series of training and other activities this month that will spill over into the remainder of the year to ensure that we maintain our tier one ranking so it's not just one thing it's several things and we have not been slow to get things going when it comes to trafficking in persons because I consider it modern day slavery mm -hmm. and it's one where people's rights and lives are really snatched from them. We developed a hand signal, we have developed several PSAs to raise awareness and we literally go into communities and places to do raids along with the Ghana police force and I must compliment the trafficking in persons unit that is primarily staffed by women and I must say that they have been working above and beyond for us to maintain this level of ranking. Wow. And going on to pensioners, right? We saw that recently they can now uplift their monies from MMG, their banks and so forth. What actually led to this move? Because oftentimes they would complain having to line up, waiting hours just to uplift it. So what led to this move to making this an easier part of their lives now? So in 2020, I distinctly remember the day I was sworn, and this is something I said, I was asked what is something I would like to achieve, and I said, no lines at the post office. Mm -hmm. And from then to now, we would have been giving one or another alternative to pensioners over the years that we've been in government, from moving to alternate venues where people could use MoneyGram, Western Union, Shorepay, and partnering with Grace Kennedy and Massey to offer these alternate venues for persons to end cash their pension, we would have seen a significant decrease at the post office. Reason being, when persons go to any one of these entities, pension is paid every day of the month and there is no line. You can walk in anytime, any day and get your pension. And a lot of these places are right in communities. So people will not have to traverse long distances to go to the post office. The post office is still very much there. But in addition to that, we would have added the bank deposit system where persons can receive their pension within the first five days of every month. I am hoping that more pensioners utilize this, especially those who have existing bank accounts. Mm -hmm. I've been speaking to some of the banks to make the process easier for pensioners to understand how to set up an account and how to be able to access this but while I would like to see more of this happening it's not happening as fast as I would want it to but right away there is literally no line unless you choose to use your card or whatever you want to do to access the money from the bank and I just want to reiterate that all the money can be accessed this way. There is no hidden fee to the pensioner. Mm. We absorb it. Mm. In addition to that, there is also the newly established program, which is in partnership with MMG. So here again, with MMG, there are a thousand plus locations across Guyana. So again, it puts a venue closer to a pensioner. They could use the MMG wallet. They could sign up now. It's ongoing. And if they want to withdraw all the money, from their MMG wallet at one time, they can do that too. That's the first thing I asked mm -hmm. when we were having these discussions. And again, no hidden fees, we absorb that as well. So that's not all. We also started the shut-in delivery where people who are bedridden, they're visually impaired, they would have to go to some place. Now they don't have to, it's a simple application to their local office. I am a shut-in, their family can apply for this for them. And the pension is delivered right at home, their book, and their pension. 
The other thing is the back of the pension book has an authorization. People can send someone to end cash, but not to collect their book. So pension book delivery will start in a couple of months. And this is a new development because when I got here, people would be in the new year and they would be qualified in the specific year and not get their books till sometime, whenever. Right. But now people, the majority of people are getting their books in the preceding year so that they can encash their vouchers right from January. You don't have to wait for a book. And the usual time is four weeks for someone to get their pension. I know sometimes there are teething issues where people not getting it within the time we are working on iron, ironing those out we are looking at an application system online now it's a printable downloaded form we're looking at the online application where we can process online to make it easier and we also have another way of delivering in in the communities that are considered remote and in hinterland communities we do the direct payments so our officers go into the villages mm -hmm. no longer people have to come out we go in and the pension is paid to those pensioners so it has involved a lot of work it has involved a lot of supporting mechanisms but we will continue to improve the pension delivery and it is my intention to mirror what we have done with pension for the permanent disability system. So everything that we are offering for pension, we will work to offer that for people who are on permanent disability because they're on that long term in a way, mm -hmm. just like pension is. And we are looking for the remainder of the year to set up a senior citizens unit at the ministry and have that mirrored regionally so that they can be a better exchange when a senior comes to our ministry their needs could be dealt with specifically and they're not lost in the bigger scheme of things. So that's some of the things we, those are some of the things that we want to do. And although you didn't ask me, I'll say that some pensioners have disabilities mm -hmm. and we're working on setting up that disability unit and we just opened a $73 million learning lab. Right. So that's open to any person who is living with a disability and while that is the hub of all training it is not the only thing we are currently constructing a residential facility for children living with disabilities in the same complex and we are also constructing a whole institution that focuses on persons living with disability mainly on a on a residential basis and it will have two areas one for those who need assisted living and one for those who can help themselves a little bit and they need the support all of that's in a complex and this is a brand new development and while again that is a site for many things we will still go out with our satellite training to work with persons living with disabilities awesome i know you mentioned quite a few of the new projects you have planned but is there anything citizens can expect for the remainder of the year from your ministry yes one of the areas that we have been working on very diligently is to do with empowerment of women mm. and the wind program is one that really has exceeded my expectations. This program has completed two years and we're in the third year. And after two years with training over 6,000 women through various platforms, virtual and in-person and utilizing UE, Coursera and UK ABME, we are seeing the interest demonstrated by women. So we have not really looked and, and seeing that we could do 6,000 in two years, we've gone a step further and we have collapsed that into one year. So we are looking at training 6,000 women and they will be trained in a slew of disciplines, but it's not ending there. We have not only trained these women and provided from levels one to levels four, levels one to level two, depending on the discipline, we are also encouraging women to utilize the business incubator that is at Ghana Women's Leadership Institute at Coven John. This incubator is one, every time I stop by, I'm happy to see women trickling in, but I'd like to see more women flowing in there. They get help with anything from writing a business plan, accessing funding, marketing, looking at the quality of their packaging, looking at whatever way we can help them. We have been doing that. And in addition to that, we have our win in business clinics where we go out into communities and do the same thing. 
Also, we have been working along with agencies like the World Food Program, and we have been providing assistance with business stimulus grants, where we are getting all of the stakeholders. We had a great stakeholders meeting. We've put all of the stakeholders together in one room. So when a person comes, they have access to everything from NIS to the bank to whatever they need for the business, registering their business. And we haven't stopped there too. We have a free advertising platform. We have an app that we have put out about a year and a half ago. We are improving this app with the intention again of partnering with MMG so that people can sell their products on this app. We have over 800 women owned businesses registered and we are hoping that before the end of the year that will become a reality. Much work has been done. I must say thank you to NDMA and MMG for working very hard with us on this and I really hope that very soon people can purchase some of the really nice things they saw at our We Lift exhibition and you know it's not just getting them there at that one time you have access all year round and it's really putting women visibly on a national platform and even international if we can get to that level but it's really taking women a far way away where they thought it was just selling to 10 people in their neighborhood or having that small audience to showcase Wow. Thank you so much, Minister. You just heard from Dr. Vindya Prasad, Minister of Human Services and Social Security. Thank you for watching. Until next time, I'm Shanae Prasad.